Hi, I'm Andy Acton. And I'm Chris Strevens. This is Dentology, the Business of Dentistry podcast. What an absolutely fascinating episode. It was. It was. I mean, we both met Abby at various things, but it's always good to know, isn't it? And to find out their sort of motivation and a bit more behind the, the, the person you meet yeah. or the, the person that other people see and hear. Yeah. Uh, uh, the bit that struck me is um, we did we, we, we did we recorded an episode a while ago now with Moonis Iqbal. And, and Moonis, a uh, very humble guy, done really well for himself. But his episode got picked out by young people in India and found him inspiring. Mm. Uh, it has the sense that this is going to be the same, particularly in the south of India, where he's from, that kind of brotherhood yeah. mentality of seeing somebody that's done so phenomenally well. But I was also quite taken with him talking about timing. I'd never really heard anybody talking about timing in the way mm. that he did and how in important that is for for his success yeah i love the the collaborative and i think it it runs through a bit like you know that sort of stick a rock thing mm. uh, you almost feel collaborative that that he wants to be successful or is successful wants to be even more successful but actually not at the expense of others no. He wants to bring people on his journey so as everybody benefits yeah. which is lovely it was, it was really good really and good. also it's a it's a generational thing Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Um, something you could do to really help us is you could subscribe because that would be amazing. We Brilliant. do release episodes every Monday at 7 o'clock in the morning. So you can get a new one pop in your inbox and you'll get a notification. So here's into the episode. Yeah, thanks very much. Here we are, another episode of Dentology. How are you doing? I'm very good, I'm very good. And this is very exciting. This is in like in a different place. It is. This is like, wow, this is like almost a proper podcast. If you're listening to this as a podcast, you wouldn't see, but we're in a studio today, which is very special. Yeah. And, um, I feel I'm going to sing. It's going to be a good sing. one. It's going to be a good one. So today we are um, very fortunate. We have a, a guest. We have Abby Krishna joining us. And Abby is the CEO of CareStack, the disruptive dental practice management software, which has recently entered the UK. He's also a serial entrepreneur and investor. Hmm. Welcome, Abby. How are you doing? Yeah, welcome, welcome. Yeah, great, Andy and Chris. Thanks for having me on your show. No, not at all. We're looking forward to it. Um, Regrettably, can I just say, I, I was going to have a great joke to start with the fact of those of you who are watching, uh, you will see this is one of the first times Abby doesn't have a beanie on. Um, however, he has got a cap on. No, it's so, all good. We uh, go on YouTube. That's true. That's true. It yeah, sends you can people see it. Loads so, of I think you the only time I've there. seen Abby without a hat on was probably in Florida, and that's probably because it was hot. <laughs> so, welcome. Be oh, before we get started, your childhood in India must feel a world away from the high tech commercial world that you're in now. But I always believe there's clues from our childhood that kind of tell us who we are today. So, is there a time you can look back on your childhood and say, that's the reason I am the person I am today. Sure, sure. Andy, I'm, um, I was born in the state of uh, Kerala, which is like the southernmost part of India. Okay. Um, and the town I come from, it's called Trivandrum, uh, which is the capital of the state. It's a very, very unique town because, you know, a, a vast portion of India is, 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 a, is, is very right-wing and conservative from a ideology perspective, whereas my state has probably been the only state which has had very left-leaning political system governing the state for the last three decades. Right. Yeah. Okay. So it's a very anomalous state, um, which in many ways doesn't identify itself as part of India, if I were to huh. give a very... Like a substance, almost. Yeah. Yeah. It's like a realistic description of folks from my state. Um, and the state is guided by the strongest feelings of brotherhood. Right. So even as kids growing up and studying, you know, though we were from this small little town, we studied all things that was happening in the world. We were fascinated as kids by stories of uh, Che Guevara, right? Mao Zedong and, you know, Karl Marx and um, all those things that was happening uh, globally. So the state is a very, very anomalous state. Uh, if you, if you, kind of match it to rest mm. of India. Mm. The state also has the highest levels of literacy in the country. So there's like abundance of human capital. Mm. Probably the most advanced public healthcare infrastructure. Mm. Just, out of, just out of interest, Abby, is there a disproportionate amount of super successful people from that region? Ask, is it like an incubator? Yeah, because like yeah, what it's, you're it's describing... It feels a bit it, like it, 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 yeah. It's a very, very small state. Right. 
which does not have a lot of so the physical... population, rough idea on population gives us sort of an idea. Yeah, yeah. Compared to the rest of India, it's it's quite small, but it you know you might find it uh, a little bit out of your range, but it's three million people. Right. Okay. So so, by, sorry, thirty million people. Right. But by right. Indian yeah. measurement, but in that's Indian quite small. Yeah. Yeah. But, in, but, but, but by yeah, it's a yeah small in, Indian measure, it's just a small number. Yeah. Um, so going back to what I was trying to state there, you know, the, the state is very anomalous because, you know, A, it has had all these left-leaning influences. Uh, but secondly, you know, because it's such a small state, it does not have a lot of real estate for physical infrastructure, mm. <laughs> right? So it put in a lot of focus on, on the human capital component of the state. For example, we consider our factories as schools, and human capital is kind of like the goods we produce from the state. Right. It's such a small state because yeah. the the lack of the physical infrastructure is really comp compensated using, you know, our our faculties um, on the education side, which can form great human capital. Right. Um, and the, and the and the state is very very multicultural in terms of its thinking, uh, diversity of thoughts, and and nothing like the rest of India. Right. So okay. I come from that state. Interesting background. Having been, um, you know, having had all of my childhood to adulthood just in that that atmosphere of... of um, Was that where you did your degree? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I okay, did my so. degree in, in the state. Uh, you know, it's a very contrarian state. And, and the communities are built and bonded by the deepest feelings of brotherhood. Right. So that's my being. So mm. <clears throat> extending from that is your, is your childhood... And, and that upbringing and that location, the thing that sets you on the path to success, or is it your environment? No, no, you know. Or is, Andy, it, I, is, is, it, is it one step before? Is it DNA? I I think it's a it's a very interesting question, Andy. You know, um, I have been a what I call as a late bloomer in life <laughs> because for a very long time in life, I have had uh, pretty much no notions around success. Um. And I, what I mean by that is that that was my natural state of being because I liked to do things at my own pace, mm -hmm. um, things which were, which had some intersection of design and creativity to, right. to 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 the way I conduct life itself. Mm. Um, and that phase of my life lasted till thirty three years of my age. In my own ways, I thought I was happy, and being happy was what successful. Right. Mm. Being you and for, and, being. And, and yeah. for context, you're 42. Correct. Now. So you, you kind of you did well for nine nine years. And mm. Much of what has happened in my life, which kind of gives me some sort of acceptance from mainstream, has happened in the last nine years. Right. But for a good 33 years of my life, it's been I I, I felt happy in my own rights. But from if you measure me by the standards of uh, the the world, I you know I'm I'm probably. But, but, but I think sometimes world measurements. I think one of the easiest measurements is numbers and money, which I don't necessarily think is the best measurement to use. I think but it it's the one that on where common, you are as well. Yeah, I think it commonly gets gets used as as, as a measurement. Um, so, so what's the catalyst? Yeah. So, so what was the change from thirty three to woof? <laughs> yeah, I think it's a it's a very um, evolutionary thing, right? So, for example, I, you know, I come from a family of traders, um, where my father, my grandfather, we have all um, run a family business in my hometown. So, in many respects, I think my, uh, I had this this whole uh, thing of trading in my DNA, mm -hmm. which I was in denial for a very long time in life, where <laughs> I spent pursuing other things in in life. Um, and then, you know, my notions about finding an employment all came down to just, you know, this, this it was just an economic activity for me uh, to find employment enough to feed myself. Mm -hmm. uh, and what I figured out doing that over a period of time is that I wouldn't fit really into a standard hierarchical system which would put, put first people in a box and then force them to find things outside the box. Right. I just did not belong to those kinds of environments. I was craving for freedom and independence. Um, so back in 2010, I started a design agency focusing on providing user experience design solutions to uh, organizations in the world. Mm. Um, and I was just happy running that agency with a 
handful of customers, you know, focused on very creative work where we could really come up with mm. Uh, solutions that would improve the end user experience primarily for software applications that were about to be mm. rolled out by large me, enterprises. That, that sounds almost like your first stepping stone from India to disrupting Correct. the practice management software system. It's an amazing what? change though, isn't it, to go from being <clears throat> employed by the sounds of things you were employed before to then sort of almost waking up one morning and go, oh, I don't want to be employed anymore. No, Chris, I was not employed for a long time. In my entire career, my employment lasted for close to two years. Right. I've had long breaks after that where I have not really gone into a full-time employment at right. all. Right, okay. And I've done freelancing. I am a self-taught designer who ended up starting a design agency after two years of freelancing um, and then kind of found a, a, a way to, in, in in many ways, fall in love with the process of design and mm. design thinking in order to create solutions that would create a meaningful impact to the end user. Mm. And in the pursuit of that that process led me from one place to another, which eventually took me to this group practice owned by uh, the largest dental insurance company in the United States. This is back in 2013. Uh, to build a product which sits on top of their dental software and allows the practice to manage their existing patients for chronic diseases, starting with a disease go going by the name of obstructive sleep apnea. And that's kind of how I got introduced to a practice. <laughs> and I was as I was building this product, which could integrate into their existing dental software to manage sleep apnea, I over the two years, I, I kind of figured out that, you know, the existing underlying dental systems were so inadequate mm. that you couldn't really bolt on solutions on top of that. And uh, that got me going on a first principles thinking mode as to how to really solve the problem, which <laughs> led me to this answer that maybe there is a way to replatform mm. the underlying right. system and create a modern system in place which can serve the needs <clears throat> of the clinical community and the business of dentistry on a single solution. And uh, that's how CareStack was born. As the idea had more subscribers uh, in people, we had the first set of investors, and you know we had fortunately we had good people joining the team in in the early phases of the company, and and you know things started mm. moving from one spot you, to another. You, you you make it sound very simple, Abby, um, and I guess a lot of that comes down to your ability to have first principle thinking that you break things down into very simple steps. But I think for lots of people listening, so you you have a user experience design company, you then go and work for. A, Dental insurance company identify an opportunity that practice management software is a bit, a bit clunky. It doesn't really work for the for the end user, and now suddenly you're you're talking about you've now got this this business, and we'll get to care stack in a minute in terms of what it's turned into. But I'm sure people are kind of scratching their heads and saying, so how does a a guy without a network in the southern tip of India come up with an idea to then suddenly find himself in the states working for an insurance company who then disrupts the practice management software, and you get interested extent where you get good people and money joining the, you. The thing for me is you suddenly end up with that, you casually passed it on, but you then get investors. Get investors <coughs> and it's like yeah. so many people this listening is, would not is, even get to the stage where they even think about it. Yeah, so what, what what are, the, are those kind of, those building blocks and those stepping stones? I, you know, Andy, I think the, the intrigue happens to people who watch the whole thing from the outside. Mm. As somebody who lived this through, I was just obsessed <laughs> uh, with this process of creating it. Right. So, I'd you, say you're still obsessed as well, Abby. Yeah, no, but <laughs> it's not for, gone yet. <laughs> yeah, no, but I was hugely obsessed with this, and I'm a very impatient person by birth. Oh, really? So Surprises once you me. get obsessed, you 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 want it out as soon as possible, <laughs> right? And then you are just like a single track train running towards mm. the objective, and you lose track of time. You just don't worry about um, worry about a lot of things that would otherwise bother people with a lot of wisdom. Right? Do you not need much sleep? I, I don't, but but my, <laughs> my, my, but my point, Chris, is, you know, you know, once I landed on this idea and this thesis mm. that maybe it, it makes sense to really rebuild the <coughs> underlying dental software program and build it in a way that you can connect it to, to other constituents and parts of the healthcare ecosystem broadly and make the practice very successful. Uh, 
Did what? you see that solution from day one? Because obviously I, most most startups no, it's, it's over two years. It, so it's quite but there, there isn't much to this thinking, Andy. You know, because these systems mm. all exist, right? Mm. In, if you walk into a dental software, you in, in in dental practice in US, you need a dental software program to manage the daily operations. Mm. Unfortunately, these programs are most 90% of the market works on desktop systems. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then they are bolted on with third party systems to manage other crucial functions like patient engagement, analytics, reporting, membership plans, mm -hmm. payments, etc. But I think people and just get used to that though, don't they? They're probably legacy the systems yeah. they? built when you know, it's mostly legacy systems at the core with some systems bolted on top mm. of it. But these are very essential systems to to build. Yeah. So CareStack, the idea of CareStack is nothing innovative. It's mm. basically looking at what's existing out there and choosing to build something that brings it all together. So the necessity of that solution is not questionable. It's mm. just something that people need to, you're really building a central operating system. What's questionable is, do you really want to do it? Because this is a very, very hard task. So the rationale mm. behind choosing to build a business around it, going against the grain of change and the forces of incumbency, that's what becomes hard. Mm. That, and it has to be for rational people. You know, people stay out of that lane because they think through it and they understand that it's a lifetime worth of work and sustained efforts for a long period of time to get mm. uh, this to, to but, fruition, but, right? But whilst it's hard, it's obviously been taken on board as a great idea, given <coughs> the, the team you've got around you and the investment no, you've had. Andy, there's no idea. The idea already exists because you're not inventing something new. You're just replicating what's out there in a better manner. The, the unknown <laughs> here is whether you would be successful doing that. Mm. And wise people, if they basically go back and compare you know, the risk, the odds of winning at it would, would choose to make a rational mm. decision, mm. right? And I I was naive, self-important, and, and, and highest degree of self-importance with great ignorance, and therefore I chose to do it. So mm. much of starting and pursuing the idea had to do with my ignorance and self-importance. Mm. Therefore, it, it, that's the that's the notion on which you start. You, you, there isn't mm. a, no, no, much novelty to the idea. But, but why would you say it's, it's, it's not an idea? It, it, it's kind of a blue ocean strategy. It's innovation and, and value. It's, it's putting things together in a different way. No, it, it's, no, it's no. Not, but it's not invention. Most things are already out there. But the way you put it together had never it had never been approached in that way but before. But that's execution. And yeah, once you start the, doing it, You'll all, and you get a bunch of people together, people will have their way of solving for it. And it's choosing, it's a choice to execute. But it's yeah. interesting, isn't it? You, you sort of end up with a, you create a techie solution, being a non-techie person, for something that, that is already there. But as you're saying, you're just adapting it. But then you have to present it to someone to say, you need to change what you've got into this. So then mm. that becomes a, a salesman's role, which quite often doesn't fit with a, Mm. with a techie person because a techie person is quite often a yeah. a techie person mm. they're not really so you, i'm assuming that's sort of how it rolled was that you sort of like spent two years designing this and then saying look guys you need to switch uh, look i think 2013 to 2014 i spent time inside the practice uh working from front to back assisting the practice with mm. daily operations mm. and because i come from a design background i get a view of what's happening as workflows inside the office and what's needed to basically streamline the workflows, you know, the existing solutions, how they work and what can be made, made better. So you have like a fundamental view of what needs to be presented to these practices, right? So that helps you create the grain of what you want to create. Yeah. Now, should you be doing that? That's a question that you have to weigh in against the total addressable market that you're trying to chase can you ever earn your right to win in that market considering the forces of competition and mm -hmm. incumbency that exist around you? You know, is it worth giving that sort of time in your life, that at that mm. specific point in your life committing to this sort of a journey? Are you successful? Will you be ever successful in finding capital yeah. in order to and resources in order to and give the, the, the journey point fulfillment? Which you're having to decide those things, it's an unlaid road. For yeah. where you are now, you can say, well, yeah, of course it was a great idea. It's worked. Yeah. But when you're sitting there without the road laid in front of you, that's quite a big decision. 
no, it was an easy decision. It, all you had to do was be naive, ignorant, and stupid. You know, <laughs> naive Congra- is great. We quite like naive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's that's all there was to it, right? Um, and I kind of think um, there's this famous co- quote by George Bernard Shaw, which 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 goes something like this: It says a um, a wise man adapts himself to the world. Um, whereas a unreasonable man adapts the world to himself and <laughs> therefore all progress in this world depends on the unreasonable man right mm. so it's one of those things you know you're just unreasonable with things around you but you say about naivety we've had many guests on where we've talked about the power of naivety so when you're setting up a a squat dental practice if people genuinely knew all the the trouble and yeah. the strife and the grief that was going to come their way they probably wouldn't do it. But or when you're in it, when you're in it, you got no choice. Mm. You've just got to deal with the issues as they come. And that's kind of a lot of what you're saying is you, you start it and then as each issue presents itself, you just find a you solution and you just keep going. I, I, I will add to that. Um, that's part true. Um, and then what, what I recognized is as you start getting smaller successes, you start becoming passionate about things. Mm. So for example... You know, so I decide to basically go at an idea of this sort and do it. And as I decide to do it, you know, I need validation for the idea. And, and you know, my biggest validation came when, you know, there was a doctor who was the dental director of Celebration, the practice where I worked for two years to, who decided to put a million dollars on the table on a PowerPoint slide to bring this idea to life. Wow. So wow. you had a customer giving you an open check of a million dollars on an unproven entrepreneur. I don't even know if I could be called an entrepreneur back then. Um, and all they probably I had some goodwill with the with two years mm. of work, I think, that I had demonstrated while working inside the practice. But besides that, there was no credentials to the resume. But I was thrown like a million dollars to basically go ahead and build it, right? Wow. And on the weight of that million dollars, what I figured out was as I was talking to other people, similar people, uh, and people who had built similar things in other industries, I saw that there was um, willingness to part with resources and money to expand on top of what the doctor had already laid on the table. That's like a sign of a success. And, mm-hmm. and that su- sign of success fuels your passion. So mm. I have I have come to this thesis that the more successful you get, the more passionate you become and more mm. purposeful you become around it as opposed to the other way around, right? Like yeah. I hear a lot of people... Success breeds success. Yeah. Success yeah. also breeds passion. You know, I, I hear many times I've, I've, I've heard people talk about how being purposeful and passionate can lead to success. I almost think in my case, it was the other way around. Right. You know, you... you, you You're getting more You, you jump into and, something. Yeah, yeah. yeah without just being trigger happy mm. and in in your journey those two years or uh, when you were starting then you sort of launched do you think was there ever a time when you thought flip i'm not too sure i should really do this or is it you know like a true as we sort of see a, an entrepreneur that says you know it doesn't matter i'm mm. just gonna I'm go all straight in. down I'm all that in. track i'm there is I'm, I'm betting on black and i'm just gonna go for but that. andy that's how i'm wired yeah i'm like a zero or one Mm. In, in in usually my life choices are all like I don't have um, I don't work like a zero point five yeah and I'm like I get obsessed once I get obsessed it's basically it is very difficult to detach myself out of it <laughs> you. you know there's this <laughs> this famous Charles Bukowski quote which says find something you love and let it kill you. Right, mm. it's one of those things. Whether whether it's be about building a company or falling in love with someone, that that quote simply, you know, it's applicable in but, both but, instances. But, but you've done it, and you've done it well. Just to kind of bring this up today, it's interesting you say that your your first practice uh, or the support was from Celebration, which is in Florida. Yeah. Um, and fairly recently, you kindly invited us over, and we attended your Inner Circle event, which was over in Florida. Uh, in fact, literally hundred yards from from Celebration at Gaylord Palms. And when we attended that, it, it struck me that your keynote speaker was Mark Gallagher, who's mm. got a career in Formula One. And he talked about people and technology equaling high performance. And if we kind of break that down into those two components, the people bit, I'm fascinated to find out because as business leaders, we set the vision 
of, in terms of where we're going, but it's our teams that will effectively live the culture and build the culture. And deliver it. Yeah, and it, and it struck me in those few days in Florida that your team completely and utterly believed in what CareStack's doing. How have, how have you built that sort of culture within the business? Because it's becoming quite a large business now. And when there's only a few of you in a room, it's easy because you can keep talking about the same thing and you can keep reinforcing mm. it with those people. But how have you set the vision and created a culture with those people to that extent? And where, quickly. Yeah, well. it's, they, it's, they, it's, they it's, deeply it's believe quick. in what CareStack's doing. How, how have you done that? I think, and it goes back to most things mm. is top down, mm. right? You know, what's happening at the top breeds down to the bottom. So I'm a strong believer in, in, in that adage. Mm. Now, that being said, you know, for us to really be successful, uh, we need to know who we are and what we stand for, right? So one of the fundamental beliefs that has led us all this while is, is, is who is CareStack to our clients in, in, in US? Are we a software company? Are we a services company? Are we a solutions company? Who are we, right? Um, it's very easy to be misled to think that we are a software company and we will build software. In my mind, we were never a software company. In my mind, we were a services company which was simply willing to do more for our customers than what they would ever pay us for. Okay? What does that statement mean in reality, right? If you look at a dental office in in U.S., um, just imagine like it's a single office, independent office with four chairs, 10 staff members um, using three to four different software programs, which are either non-integrated with one another or loosely integrated. Mm -hmm. um, and, and staff members uh, who are probably um, not having a, a great education of any sorts. And, and the doctor... Um, not a trained operator, mm -hmm. uh, primarily a clinician running an office. Right? Uh, you this, described a fairly typical UK dental yeah. practice yeah, as yeah. well. It, I, I think all, 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 most of the offices globally, this mm. is like a common theme. For a practice of this sort, right, from an operator's perspective, from the practice owner's perspective, the fundamental thing that matters to them is, you know, the amount of dentistry that they do the sort of relationships that they can maintain with their patients and some sort of a peaceful atmosphere that they can have at the practice. Yeah. But with all those inefficiencies that exist and the administrative burden going down, a dentist basically ends up not having enough time for themselves mm -hmm. um, and not enough time for growing the practice by <coughs> focusing on the patients. This mm -hmm. is like a usual scenario. Now, this is the vantage point from which we look at this situation. So if you go back to breaking down to who we are, mm -hmm. you know, how do we do more for our customers than what they pay us? It gets us to this fundamental understanding that we are not a software company, but we are a software-led solutions company, which is going to do a set of things for our clients that reduces the administrative burden inside the offices simplifies the work and the life of our clients and gives them more time to focus on themselves, their team, and their patients. Mm -hmm. Now, that clarity is set, right? Now, how do we operationalize it in terms of the service offerings, the product offerings that we provide, right? That vision statement that we are a business solutions company willing to do more for our customers than what, we pay, pay, what they pay us for, then trans translates into our offering strategy. So we say, okay, we're going to build a modern cloud-based practice management software system. We are going to have integrated payments as part of it, integrated memberships, analytics, integrated phone systems. And then we are going to build a service division which does insurance reimbursement services, virtual assistant services, basically involve ourselves in daily <coughs> operations of the practice in a technology-led manner which allows us to provide services that ultimately reduces their administrative burden mm -hmm. and function as part of their team, right? And yeah. make all of this economically viable for ourselves while mm -hmm. we make a profit and makes business value to the practice, mm -hmm. right? So this sort of clarity is kind of very key for 
you to build good culture in your team. Now, okay, this is the end state that we want to basically provide for our customers, which means you keep the customer at the very center of your universe. Now, how do you build a team, right? I'm the staunch believer that you build good culture when there's an inspiring model of growth. Mm. You don't start with culture and move forward. You rather focus on success and you create a culture. And, and the culture is a byproduct of a continuous stream of successes yeah. that you can continuously mm. create that fuels an environment of growth, it's right? The success is passion. Yeah, so I think yeah it links it back down, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so now with that being said, I got to convert this statement now into doing more for our customers than what we are willing it's to. It's got to become something. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And therefore, this culture, if you look at the core of how culture forms, it, it forms when you're able to bring together people, structure, and incentives. You know, when you put all these mm. three things together, the intersection that you get, that's pretty much what you would call as culture mm. in your time, right? So let's look at the component. So if I have to provide do more for our clients than what they pay us for, then I need to be able to hire people who will do more for us than what we pay them for, mm. right? And you know, Andy, you know, we always play with the hands that we get dealt with. Yeah. You know, you don't always have the liberty of getting to a lot of those sorts of people. So your people are going to be a mixed bag. Some of them will do more than what, what we pay them for. Some of them will do less. Some of them will do just <laughs> enough, right? And therefore, we created a structure and an, and, and an incentive program uh, to manage for those uh, very, very unique situations. You know, so you look at your people component and you figure out, okay, you have a good understanding of where your people component lies, how much of structure is essential, how much of incentives are essential mm -hmm. that puts it all together, that the net result is the outcome that can support the mm. statement, the vision statement for the company. And this is a very, very conscious product. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a byproduct of conscious thought mm. in a few different angles. You know, your, your people, structure, and incentives, bringing these three angles together mm. requires you to have a deep sense of time and timing. You mm. need to understand the fact that you need to, you are in a long game, right? Most businesses, especially businesses like ours, gets built over a 10 to 15 year window, mm -hmm. right? So you think about life in like chunks of 15 and 20 years of, uh, that's your that's your mindset, right? The second bit is you need to have a even but that, more- but, but, but that in itself is quite unusual thinking, isn't it? As particularly in the modern world where- but Andy, you got to understand, I started when I was 33. I waited so long to start. <laughs> See, <laughs> yeah, that's gone. why you're in a rush. Yeah, man. yeah. You got some catching that's up to do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Making up for lost years. No, but but even more more funnily, you know, waiting another 15 years is no big deal. No, but, right? yeah, yeah, so, yeah. but, but, but that's the interesting thing, isn't it? For you, you know, to use your phrase, a late bloomer, to, to then get into a business that you're saying is going to take me 10 to 15 years and yeah. I've got to think Patience in, to in build, chunks. Yeah. That That's kind of not modern society these days is everybody wants everything instantly people yeah. aren't prepared to invest you people know. want to build sell it five times yeah. boom off, but, i'm done but that's you know that's also very specific to who people are it varies from people to people in mm. my case i got sense of that that mm. timing that mm. i mean the time that's required for yeah really creating a business of this sort. But this also goes back to the vision. The vision gets set by the person at the top that says, this is how I see this thing evolving, and then gets gets yeah. passed I'm down. I'm interested in your <clears throat> recruitment culture, because yeah, for the guys listening, it's quite an interesting one. Um, when you recruit, do you look for good people who might come from dentistry, or dentistry which has good people, or does it not really matter? Because we sort of say to our, our guys when we talk to them, actually, you want to recruit good people because you can train them to do the other stuff. So do you sort of look at the same way and think, actually, I want to recruit good people. If they happen to have dentistry, that's great, but actually I just want good people. Chris, this question also ties back to the previous questions, which I wanted to complete. So one is that you end up optimizing your journey for a long enough time, mm. right? The second bit is the timing of where you are. While you can be very rigid on the vision, you always become flexible on the details. Right? So timing-wise, timing-wise, 
you know, there are timing is a very, very hard construct to master in business, right? Mostly it comes down to just timing. If you are a great student of timing and you have a knack of making decisions, get just just gets the timing right, you will do phenomenally well in life. But timing is so hard that there's no playbook that really teaches you timing at mm. probably five million playbooks to get it wrong. Mm, yeah. Right. Therefore, you know, timing wise, you 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 figure out, okay, I have something to accomplish, right? I'm gonna make a decision. And you sometimes end up making a decision ahead of its time, or sometimes you end up making a decision, you know, later than mm. what where it's supposed to make. So there's always gonna be a gap considering when you act on something, mm. right? That's kind of where you need to fill that gap using the right structure of people, structure and incentives. Let's say you made a decision ahead of its time, okay? The sort of hiring, onboarding, retention, and governance of the people that you put into place, you need to account for the fact that, okay, you have made something early on time and therefore you can afford a certain choice of people, right? Mm -hmm. Let's say you make something later than the required time. Now you have to catch up, mm -hmm. which means the choice of people that you that you hire and the structure and the operating freedom and the incentives that you put in place. You have to create enough fluidity for people to run fast enough to cover yeah. up for a mm -hmm. gap. Therefore, you know, the, the, the whole concept of hiring and, and retention is to be thought out in the context of timing. Mm. Um, and, and you know, I, I strongly believe that it's horses for the courses. Mm. While you don't have to commit yourself to hiring people who can be toxic influence on the organization, yeah, I think there isn't a single lens to hiring. It, you, you need a far more balanced lens of looking at your, your people component and your structure and your incentives in the context of timing and for the time that you want to exist and come down to a very zoned in decision. Very, very interesting. I think people will take a lot from that in terms of that as a as an outlook. Just, just going back to the time. So, so you know, Andy, so just to, yeah, so, yeah. so what, how do we hire at, at Kerstack? Mm. What we have figured out that we have a view of the business, which is 15, 20 years of time, right? So we are going to be a business which becomes successful due to a function of time. And therefore, we have enough data now to understand how we need to hire, okay? So we try to optimize our hiring strategy with, with people, at least 20% of our workforce with people who are high performance, who have, who have the foundation for high performance and who uh, come with a high degree of alignment to the mission, uh, which brings, which, which gives them, which gives consistency uh, persistence and patience. Mm -hmm. So 20% of our workforce is that. The other 80% of the workforce we optimize for longevity and consistency over talent. As soon as they are consistently right? providing. Yeah. Correct. And and they're coachable and they're trainable and they don't go into a zone of misalignment. We, we bring yeah. that. And the dental industry knowledge, as time has progressed, we have so much of internal systems in place where we can now start accommodating talent from other parts of the, in, from other verticals and other <clears> industries <throat> that that's not a blocker for us anymore. We are right. very open to that process. Uh, but that's how kind of how we come down to a decision. We look at 20% to be, you know, high performance and high alignment and the other 80% we are okay with low performance and middle performance. But mm. We try to bring on people who who, mm. who are Want aligned, to be consistent, and deliverance. Don't also, you? imagine it would be exhausting. Imagine, you know, imagine if the twenty percent was a hundred percent. It'd be exhausting that everybody's just high performing. You'd probably with. just drop the ball, wouldn't you? Because oh, people yeah. just wouldn't deliver. But it goes back to what you were saying before about your your a software business, but actually your business solutions, and it's as much to do with service as software. And if yeah. you don't have the eighty percent focused on service and delivery, then it could just be chaos. Which, well, I imagine that I, I'd sort of think to myself that, that with a software business, you sort of think about, I, I just think about us, you know, most of our software works. Yeah. 
<laughs> and you only really need it when when something doesn't work but then you need the customer service that helps you yeah. understand how to make that's it what work you want. better you, you, you? you want it to free you up to do the thing yeah, where yeah, you make right. your money as you were saying to concentrate on the patients yeah so as you can have a better yeah. conversation you just going back to the time in florida i noticed that you refer to your clients as partners when we were out there i heard the phrase quite regularly but yeah our partners our partners it's a very collaborative approach and a collaborative term how do your clients partners um, help you develop CareStack as a, as a solution? Oh, yeah, Andy, we are a function of time. You know, CareStack mm. wouldn't have survived without our early customers mm. uh, because 90% of the company, 95% of CareStack are folks without any dental bang background, including myself, mm. right? We all come from a non-dental background with very varied interest and, um, and we did not, we fundamentally think we are mostly dumb people to a, to a very for very good reasons because you you don't understand workflows you don't understand offices the empathy required to understand the nuances of a dental mm. office workflow doesn't get set from day one mm. right mm. so what but who we are are two things you know intent wise we are very very obsessed with our clients we are we genuinely want our clients to succeed mm. right yeah and then we are learning machines you know that's the strength of care stack we are learning machines we can start from a blank slate and build the skills up and learn rapidly in order to basically serve the most value for our clients mm. right so when you come with these and this is the culture code of care stack right like intense form of customer mm. obsession and continuous learning right if I'm you saying that must help because you yeah i'm assuming you have then a really good feedback loop from your clients who say actually it'd be really this, good if this it, creates, if it could do this mm. so therefore you guys then go and do that which then delivers it and then oh there's something else that, and, and we it can must constantly move and this sort of a culture code doesn't survive on its own it needs an integrated effort from your customer community and we've been very fortunate in all the markets where we launched to get early set of customers who come and look at CareStack as a joint mission. So for them, it's this company is also about realizing themselves. There's a there's there's a, a certain aspect of CareStack where we want customers to feel that CareStack is theirs too. Mm. Um, it's interesting. I think it, it 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 dovetails brilliantly with right at the beginning. You were saying the state you come from. Is a very sort of feels a very collaborative. I think state. so. That it's, brotherhood. It, it almost, for, you know, a lot <laughs> yeah. of people say about partners, but you, you're never really too sure if they really truly mean partners. But yeah. I think from what you're saying, and uh, it's it's sort of embedded in you really, which mm. then embeds into care state, which is quite. I, I can give you examples, Andy. You know, there's like annual events in our customer sites um, where I I go to um, change tables. Uh, put their stuff together so and it, it could be some of these are like single site practices um and and you know it make it would make no financial sense to to do all of that mm. right but then it has become some sort of a tradition um because the energy that you get while interacting with these founders ability to freely brainstorm or a drink yeah. mm. right the perspectives that you can open yourselves to and the feeling of belonging that you get is like it's a, it's a, it's your superpower over time mm -hmm. that that um, allows is, is, you is, to. Is there a risk as care set gets bigger and you move further away from from that? Because it's 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 already a sizable business, but you have huge ambitions for it. So, are you still going to be putting tables together when you've got twenty thousand practices? <coughs> but Andy, the the only way to manage that is to basically make sure that the company is product led for life. Mm. You know, I don't see CareStack having a sales led leadership. Uh, in the company ever. Mm -hmm. You know, at the core of this company exists our undying commitment and obsession to the customer and a deep-seated form of product-led thinking in order to solve these problems mm. and deliver valuable solutions to the market. Mm. Uh, the conscious effort that we will have to put into place is to keep the company extremely product-led and to steer away from a sales-led culture uh, that cripples innovation over time. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the choices of people that we bring in, in you know, into the leadership 
we look for people who are who have a more balanced view of the business that is at the intersection of product, mm. sales, distribution, operations, and customer success. Mm. Mm. Most of our leaders, if not all of them, have a certain degree of proficiency on the product. Mm. And over time, if they don't get there, they will get replaced. I think if that can be retained, it would mm. it would make it an exceptional business because well, you do you sell loads of stuff. Don't yeah, you? but you see, you it. see it over time. <laughs> thinking back to you know Florida again, but you know Walt Disney when Walt Disney started, you know the Disney Empire. That was about creating a family experience. You pay once to get into the park. He didn't like the fun fair mentality of you had to pay every time. He liked this concept of you pay once, you go in, and you get access to everything. However, as time rolls on, that was back in the the sixties roll for 60 years and now there's lots of incremental sales things happening in that organization to drive revenue to drive shareholder value so i think if if it can be retained as a product-led business i think that would make it distinctly different from some of the greatest companies that we've got out there because that, i think that's over time you, they tend to shift that's how you we, we, we view the business mm. we are very product-led you know extremely client obsessed extremely product-led. Mm. So you take all the client obsession to identify high-value problems. That goes back to putting time back into their hands mm. by reducing their administrative mm. burdens. Yeah. And you solve those problems with a high degree of product mindset. Mm. Your, your solutions are extremely product-led. Yeah. And as that continues to happen, you see the brand equity getting built mm. as we are delivering on our mission statement mm. of doing more for our customers yeah. than what they pay us for. And that almost has a compounding effect with time. Yeah. And even at scale, I think these cultural values have to be propagated down. And you know, as long as you're, 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 these things are always top down, as long as you stay true to who you are mm. and you're making a very conscious effort towards making sure that your organization is subscribing to these values on a near consistent mm -hmm. basis, I think you can preserve that sort mm. of intense culture. Yeah. Uh, I'm intrigued by one element. You talk so clearly about your your strategy for the business and your vision for where it's going. Yeah, I've heard you describe yourself a number of times before as imperfectly perfect. And you use the, the analogy of a kintsugi, which you can probably explain <laughs> to people what that is. So what is Kintsugi and, and what is imperfectly perfect for you? Because for somebody who has such clarity of thought about their business, it's interesting that you also describe yourself as being imperfectly perfect. Yeah. Um, and, it can, you know, I'll come back to, I'll start with Kintsugi. You know, Kintsugi is a um, repairing technique that originated back in the Japan in the 15th century. It was uh, started by this <coughs> Japanese emperor, <coughs> His name is uh, Ashikaga Yoshimasa. Um, and, and what happened is his favorite tea bowl, um, it, it broke uh, and he wanted it repaired and he sent it to China. Mm -hmm. And the Chinese craftsmen basically put it together. And what they tried to do it is they reconstructed the, the broken bowl using metal staples, which looked very ugly to the emperor. So he wanted it he gave it back to the Japanese craftsmen to redo it and make it look aesthetically mm. pleasing. And the Japanese craftsmen took the broken bowl and put it back together using a form of Japanese lacquer called as the urushi. And they put the pieces together and then they took powdered gold dust and applied it on the cracks. So this object that got mended, it came back to life and it looked much more beautiful uh, than the object which um, prior to it was broken, right? So that that process, uh, kin means gold and suji means joinery. So kinsuji stands for golden joinery. Right. It, it's, it's that process of, um, you know, mending things which are broken and bringing it back to life. And in that, that process, it's a very time intensive, specialized process, which also celebrates the history of the pro mm. you know of the of the object it it flaunts the, its flaws and makes the person mm -hmm. fall more in love with that that whole process mm. right or with the object mm. it, it enhances the value the emotional attachment on the on the object now that's kintsugi and the repairing technique owes its genesis back to a japanese uh, philosophy of wabi sabi uh, which originated again in the 15th century. You know, wabi means fresh and simple. 
and sabi means beauty that stems from age uh, and wabi sabi stands for the simplistic beauty of all things which is aged and worn out so um, and the wabi sabi principles are all built around zen buddhist teachings primarily around which says that nothing in life is perfect nothing in life is complete and uh, nothing in life is permanent mm-hmm. and and therein lies life's beauty mm-hmm. right and and those are the principles on which uh, wabi sabi is built and if you take a deeper look at it you will you will you will see there is so much importance to these simple teachings right mm-hmm. like you know to begin with your worries are not permanent you know you, you should all uh, know that that there is this adage that this too shall pass which is a very uh, elegant way to express the transience of life right mm-hmm. no trouble no challenge uh, which stands the test of time you know with time everything vanishes and mm. um, you know life comes back to some sort of stability and normal right so so that's that's there nothing is perfect you know life is the imperfection is the very natural state of life right there's in the thing called as the perfect thing mm. in in the mm. modern world we have so much of obsession around perfection oh, and definitely. symmetry oh, and instagram all that and, and you find and it's you know, stressful and it's, it's false yeah you know, it's, 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 yeah it's false, false and stressful trying to kind of create, create this perfect out, world yeah. nothing yeah, and you, what you're saying is embracing it actually de-stresses the situation mm. imperfection just <clears throat> fundamentally understanding that to be imperfectly perfect or you know just just to be mm. imperfect is the natural state of life yeah um uh, allows you to basically appreciate the present moments mm. right mm. and and a- again it goes back to like nothing in life is complete either yeah. so all you know work of art or all work of nature mm. you will see that it's a very incomplete process only to lead to something else mm. right um so so that that's that sort of thinking allows you to fundamentally practice acceptance to most things that mm. happens to you and once you get mm. to the fact that you can accept things that is happening to you mm. you start obsessing less on the finish lines mm-hmm. and you start focusing more on the next mm. steps and that gives you an endless list of possibilities to and, play with and have you always <clears throat> felt like that have you or is that something that's developed over time no i you know i i have been a victim to to perfection and um you know i've, I've, I've uh, learned some of these things through hard lessons right. you know so i uh, i'm still i still struggle with it as i work with the teams and and try to um you know dream up instances of perfection and then coming to realize that how stupid i am as i go on to that pursuit so it's like i, I have to constantly remind myself about the fallacy of perfection um but while i say these things i also want to tell you something that was quoted by this f- favorite author of mine called charles bukowski he said that you know you should discard perfection as the as the ache of the greedy but do not fall into the trap of the mass modesty of in, in, easy imperfection mm-hmm. so while it's okay <coughs> to not chase perfection mm. it, you might not want to become prey to easy imperfection yeah, yeah, either yeah, yeah. don't accept media don't accept yeah. Yeah. and therefore you know between perfection and imperfection lies this fine middle line called as excellence mm. Yeah. So you need to push towards excellence yeah, like and, and 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 that's kind of like that. what's going to yeah. contribute towards success. Well, why we've got you on our dentology therapy couch. Um you're you're impatient. You're an impatient guy. So why is is that because you you feel it, it took you 33 years to get going? But where does that impatience come from? Because it's relentless. I I think Andy it, it is also a function of uh, many many different things, right? um my impatience is is uh, comes from um a little bit of uh rage and anger as well um it's interesting <laughs> you know i took a uh, you know i i you know i i have not found my uh fit in in my social circumstances for a very long time um i've always been a misfit in you know uh, growing up in a town uh, adopting um 
adopting things in life which was anything but mainstream, right? And, and growing up in an anomalous manner compared to uh, the traditional values that my family oh, up, up, mm. upheld, you know, choosing to drop in and out of jobs yeah. for a long, long time. Did that cause tension? Oh, yeah, all the time. Uh, you know, I, I was a constant source of worry to my parents. Oh, really? You know, into my early 30s, people thought that I would I would possibly die on the streets or something like that for wow. the sort of choices that I did in life. <laughs> okay. um, so there's, the, there's this residual rage that results from not having your spot figured out in a system that you're supposed to mm. exist, right? Uh -huh. And, um, you know, CareStack has been my um, only worthwhile thing in life. Uh -huh. Right. And, and, you know, it has allowed me to basically um, appreciate life and, and keep myself whole. Uh, and I think if Kashak was not there, I would have transitioned into a total nuisance to the society. <laughs> right, so it's interesting, isn't it? It's almost like that thing. What do they say? You find your tribe. It's almost like you couldn't find your tribe, so you created your own one. Mm. Yeah, so you know that, that's yeah, yeah. quite an interesting one, isn't it? And 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 therefore, you know, all these, uh, and then it it grew beyond my, you know, it grew beyond me. It grew into a company. We employed nine hundred people today. Mm. It serves as a pathway for a lot of young people mm. uh, from my part of the world. Uh, to maximize the potential. Mm. Do you look back have. on it, you know, like when you've got all this, you've got 900 people, you're doing really well in the, the US, then you're you're going to come here and dominate, well, we think we can dominate the UK and you've got uh, Australia and Singapore. Do you sometimes sit there and go, oh, pinch me, pinch me, I've got all this no. going on? No, I, I, I don't. You know, I, I, you know, I, I, I think it was, uh, there's a lot of work which has gone into the whole thing. I also think, you know, we were at the right place at the right time. Yeah. I, so I, I back to time again. But I also think we have put in a lifetime worth of work into this whole thing, right? So mm. let, let me just touch base on this position of impatience, right? So I think as Kersha grew into this platform beyond me, right? What I recognized is the same sort of uh, realization and fulfillment that I had, you know, starting from a zone of um, you know, no significance to to you know to to some sort of a semi honorable position in my my society. <laughs> I, 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 I I think everybody at Kerstack has a shot at that sort of you know fulfillment. Mm -hmm. So I get impatient about the fact that human human potential is not getting maximized. There's so much of residual potential inside care stack, which mm -hmm. can have like a self-perpetuating effect if we can unlock it, right? So a lot of my impatience comes from, from my the, the inability to unlock that potential <clears throat> into a, a, a machine which can take the company and what we represent to greater heights. That's one part of it, right? The other part of the, the whole whole process is that, you know, as we continue to build on these smaller successes and we create like a like a a, a, a business against it, right? You need to think of CareStack as a generational business, which mm -hmm. can transcend the test of time and and be there for the next hundred years, right? Which means it has to be fueled by growth at it, at its very core. Mm. This machine has to basically grow and get down to the zone of being able to have a very, very uh, non-linear way of growing, mm. right? And dental is one place where, uh, you know, you're, 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 the pace of change that this market basically has isn't as high as, um, you know, what, what you would find in some of these other verticals. So mm. I always get impatient about the fact that why isn't CareStack growing uh, at, a, at a certain pace of change that you could possibly realize in some of these other verticals and other industries. Mm. So it's it's basically these two aspects which which breeds mm. that impatience. Right? Now, when, when can yeah, we get... It sounds like quite a healthy impatience. It's, a, it's an energy and a passion to get it's to... It's an angry... Get, yeah, it's to get there quicker, it's to do more. I, for me, yeah, I don't know how others feel about it. <laughs> yeah, but they, they, they might not agree with it. <laughs> I think so. And I, I think, uh, 
you know, from my perspective, I think it's impatience is good. If you had to strip back all your experience so far to one key learning from your mm. entrepreneurial journey, what would you say is the the one thing that you take from your your journey so far? Yeah, it basically comes down to your ability to understand timing. Mm. The, the this journey simply comes <clears throat> down to how well you have mastered the art of timing. Mm. If you get your timing right, you have nailed it. I have never yet met an entrepreneur who has got his uh, timing right, but his skills and his charisma and his competencies were not so great, uh, who has gone broke. Mm. But the reverse has always have seen smart people um, with all the resources who have simply screwed up on the timing, <laughs> you know, going into the dumps. I've, I've seen it many, many times. Mm. So this journey is all about the wisdom, the introspection, the retrospection, uh, and the constant pursuit of learning that you need to apply mm. in order to master the art of timing. Mm. Okay. Very interesting. And understanding. Yes. yes. And it simply comes <clears throat> down to as simple as when do you do what? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. That's what timing comes down to. Mm -hmm. It's just that simple thing of when do I do mm. something in my business and in some aspects, mm. how do yeah. I do it? This this understanding is kind of very easy to be able to articulate, but extremely difficult to basically put in into action mm. in a real mm. world sense. Mm. Right? Fascinating. And and on the point of timing, um, we're done. But we can't let you go just yet. Without we have, the question. We have two questions for you before you can leave. So the first question is, if you could be a fly on a wall in a situation, mm -hmm. where would you be and who would be there? If I could be a fly on a wall in a situation, I would uh, want to um, be in that room where I get to see Warren Buffet and Charlie Munger make decisions <laughs> ah, okay. um, as they make investment decisions. Mm. Right? Those they've, guys are, they've, they've mastered timing, haven't they, those oh, boys? Oh, they have. <laughs> and and they're like so much uh, ingrained into first principle thinking. Mm. And uh, if you if you really look at it, right, they've said some of the profound things. Mm -hmm. um, because, in, in a, you know, in a, in a world where progress is a very, very re relative thing, right? It's, it's, it's like... Um, you don't have to be the smartest guy in the room. You have to do just enough things to be less stupid than most of the guys in the room. <laughs> I spent my whole life doing that. <laughs> right? So just yeah. if you could, if you, this is a this is a very very uh, astute principle when it comes to investing. Mm. You know, exactly. training yourself mm. and disciplining yourself to do less stupid things, mm. and try to do that for a very very long time that whole discipline has such a compounding effect on how your businesses shape, mm. right? So um, I would have loved to be a fly on the wall listening to how they make some of yeah, these decisions Interesting. just by learning from other people's mistake mm. <laughs> and, and, you know, and, and building that discipline of sticking to doing less stupid things. And it would be, a, it would give you a, whole lot of learning you know yeah fantastic interesting and you're given the opportunity to meet somebody so you can sit down with somebody <clears throat> with a cup of coffee or, or a glass of whiskey yeah fictional or not who would you who would you like to take the opportunity to sit down with charles bukowski oh really yeah hell yeah <laughs> you're fascinated by him aren't <laughs> yeah, you? yeah he's he's <laughs> one of the most uh well, we uh, haven't had that one before. This no, <laughs> interesting. I'm not sure we'll have it again. No, either. I think it'd be unlike. Yeah, interesting people. You know, mm. uh, there's a funny Charles Bukowski story, and you know, it's a, it's a. I've, I've mentioned this on a, in a couple of places. You know, this guy worked at a post office for a lot of time in his life, almost mm. 26 years or so, um, and he, he he used to take his publications to the publishers and get them to publish his writings and nobody would even give him a hearing. Um, nothing to blame them because the guy was perpetually drunk. You know, he spent all his money on women. Um, and he, he simply said and did miserable things. 
So, so people wouldn't really entertain him at all. And finally, I think after 20 plus years or so, one of the publishers decided to give his writing a shot and um, they decided to give him a break at a, by paying him a very small fee. And the guy published his first book called as The Post Office. Um, and that publication became like a raging hit <laughs> that he was catapulted to the highest levels of success overnight. And what happened after he got successful, um, he, he obviously made more money. He had more offers coming his way. And you would feel that, you know, when, when um, you get successful and you get integrated to the society, mm. you would start becoming a little bit more honorable. Mm. And, and nice and and uh, you, you try to value that success. <laughs> he did none of that. He was just... <laughs> uh, just uh, more. Yeah, just more same expensive. guy he was before um, he became successful, just that he had now more money to spend on wine and women. Yeah. Right? So Better wine, better women. And you would wonder why he did that. And, and, you know, this guy had such profound understanding of himself that he... Um, made his declaration to the world on his tombstone on why he was he chose to be the same person before and after mm. success. You can find it in the two words he inscribed on his tombstone, which said, don't try. He just summarized everything that he had to tell to the world in just two simple words. Don't try. Don't try. Right? So... At least he remained true to himself. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, and, uh, <coughs> and 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 I have not heard something more profound, which goes back at mm. the base of um, looking at, at humans as 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 uh, you know yet another form of the animal species, mm. right? So for for just those two words, you know, he's my all time favorite. Wow! It, it just summarizes how I feel about life. Yeah, right? brilliant. Abby, it's been an absolute joy. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, we know you're an incredibly busy guy, so we appreciate the time you've made available to us. It's been good fun. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks, thanks, really, really yeah, thanks, thanks, Abby. Thanks, Abby. Very good. All Thank right. you. Lovely. Thank you for listening to this episode of Dentology, where we discuss the business of dentistry. If you like what you heard, please do subscribe where you found this episode. That would be amazing. And also follow us on Instagram.